From Carnegie Council in New York City, I'm Devin Stewart. This is Asia Dialogues, where we gather insights on the future of U.S.-Asia relations. I've spent several long periods in Myanmar, um, the longest of which was six months, researching, I guess, the mechanics of the violence, um, and trying more latterly in particular to focus on the perpetrators, um, because a lot of media coverage inevitably ends up focusing on the victims of violence. So with this latest um, military campaign, because media can't go to Northern Rakhine State, they've homed in on the Rohingya refugees who have fled to Bangladesh. But I've always been interested in what motivates people to participate in um, violence, particularly when it's against their neighbours or one-time friends. Hi, I'm Devin Stewart here at Carnegie Council in New York City, and today I'm speaking with Francis Wade. He's the author of a new book on the Rohingya, uh, the Rohingya crisis in Burma, also known as Myanmar. His book is called Myanmar's Enemy Within, Buddhist Violence and the Making of a Muslim Other. Francis, uh, thanks so much for coming by to our New York studios uh, from your your base in London. Thank you. So uh, this is an extremely timely book. It's published by Zed Books um, and distributed by Chicago, University of Chicago Press. That's right, right, yeah. Um, So how did you... Uh, come up with the idea of writing such a book it seems so timely what, what sort of tipped you off to um, to embark on this project well I'd been following the story of the Rohingya since um, well before the first wave of communal violence between um, Buddhists and Muslims in Western Myanmar and mm-hmm. um, that began in 2012 but for three years before then, from early 2009 to 2012, I'd been working with an exiled Burmese media organization in northern Thailand called the Democratic Voice of Burma. Mm-hmm. And that was composed of um, student activists, refugees, um, who had crossed over the border, most of whom who had left Burma in um, the early 90s or late 80s. Um, to seek sanctuary in Thailand. They set up a news organization. I worked as a sub-editor for that news organization. Um, Mm. Was that Chiang Mai? That was in Chiang Mai, yeah. And I began there before the transition was even being talked about, so beginning of 2009. Um, And the stories we would cover were quite sort of, um, I hate to say, I guess, uh, quotidian in the sense that it was quite predictable. It was a dictatorship at the time. Mm-hmm. So the stories we would cover would be, you know, land grabs by the military, human rights abuses committed by troops and so on. Um, and from time to time, there would be a story about this community, the Rohingya. Um, but they were very much off the radar. And the only time they seemed to come to public attention was when uh, an event happened that precipitated a regional um, crisis. Mm. So an event in Rakhine State that would cause Rohingya to flee the country and then they would wash up on boats on the shores of Thailand, for example. Um, And those are really the only times when the Rohingya came to public attention. Then the transition began in 2011 um, and there had been much adulation, much hope that this would be the sort of final break with military rule in Myanmar um, and that the country would be moving towards an inclusive society. Um, and that sort of age-old, long-running ethnic conflicts would be brought to a close. Right. So it's full of sort of optimism. Then in 2012, um, an incident happened in Rakhine State in Western Myanmar when three Rohingya men raped a Rakhine woman. And that triggered um, sort of four or five days of quite vicious violence between Rohingya and Rakhine. And after that, Rohingya were confined to camps, confined to ghettos, confined to villages... Um, this very strong apparatus of control grew up around Rakhine State that targeted Rohingya specifically. So suddenly this community that hadn't really received much attention before came to dominate um, coverage of the transition. Now, <clears throat> there was also an episode of, of rapes and murders in Mandalay, um, which, which has been you know, uh, sort of agitated by the monk Waratu as you probably know, and um, 
in that in in that instance, um, the the rape allegations were manufactured to That's to right. incite violence, uh, which took a few months to come out. Um, w w did you investigate the, the sort of legitimacy of of the um, of the allegations? I hadn't at the time. So the Mandalay violence happened, as far as I can remember, in middle of two thousand and fourteen. Um, so that was two years after the first wave of violence broke out in Western Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Um, and what had happened was um, the violence in Western Myanmar between Buddhist Rakhine and Muslim Rohingya. Right, and the Rakhine, a very poor, very poor province. That's correct. It's the poorest state in the country. Um, the Rakhine themselves have, lo have long been victims of military abuse. Um, They're also it's called neglect. Arakan. Exactly, yeah, Arakan. Um, and that had essentially been from what I could tell, a local contestation between two ethnic groups, the Rakhine who believe themselves to be indigenous um, to the state, the Rohingya who the, whom the majority of Rakhine believe to be illegal interlopers from Bangladesh mm -hmm. who are trying to claim an indigenous status so that they could gain citizenship and so the narrative goes, um, begin the Islamization of Myanmar. Mm -hmm. um, but that local violence in Rakhine State seemed to have a contagious effect and began to um, and was followed by eruptions of Buddhist on Muslim violence in towns in central Myanmar that beforehand had never experienced such violence. So first we had Mektila, which is a small town just south of Mandalay. There was a fight in a gold shop between Buddhists and Muslims. Then a monk was killed by Muslims, and that triggered three days of attacks that killed sort of upwards of 40 people, completely destroyed Muslim neighborhoods. Then the Mandalay violence happened a year later, and in that period there had been a growing ultra-nationalist monk-led movement that agitated primarily against Muslims. Um, and Uwarathu, who's the monk you referenced, who conjured up these allegations of rape, had been and is a very vocal um, agitator against Muslims. He sees them as a significant threat to Buddhism. Um, he believes that if Islam isn't contained, then it will spread and it will be the ruin of Buddhism. But he also has an agenda that's very closely aligned with conservative political forces in the country and the military. Mm -hmm. So there's a belief, although there are no, there's no smoking gun, that he's effectively um, doing the sort of bidding of the military, of the deep state in Myanmar. And in, in what sense, in terms of fostering um, rumors and making exactly. people worried about security and therefore justifying the, the role of, of the military? Is that Exactly, you know? yeah. Um, I think there's a sense that the military... Although the military had very much choreographed this transition, it knew that it wanted to retain um, effective control of the country, um, of the political system, of the, econom of the economy, um, and of the security infrastructure. Um, and the military knows, and it's a sort of tried and tested um, strategy, that violence that's more, I suppose, communal in its expression injects a sense of fear into society and it causes society or causes civilians to look to you know a supposed protector and they've very deftly raised the spectra of a threat in the form of islam that if it isn't contained then it will uh, sort of dislodge buddhism from its central position in society mm -hmm. um and so one could i suppose um deduce or uh, speculate. I think it's stronger than speculation. There's ample evidence that the violence was organized, um, that mobs came into Mandalay, came into Mektila um, from outside. And that's a strategy that's been used by the military over the decades to stir violence um, and to, so they, in a sense, yeah. Did, did they bring in fear. thugs to sort of you know, get, get yeah. the violence going? So they have these networks of um, civilian thugs, mm -hmm. often people from sort of impoverished backgrounds, mm -hmm. and they will pay them, um, you know, it could be $3, it could be a bowl of biryani or something for a day's work, mm -hmm. so roughing up communities. And particularly when the uprisings occurred in 1988 and 2007, suddenly from nowhere, amid these crowds of protesting monks or protesting students, 
civilians would wade in and start beating people mm -hmm. and then suddenly withdraw as sort of um, magically as they appeared. Mm -hmm. um, and they're certainly a network of organized thugs. They're kind of like, I guess, the brown shirts that the Nazis used to break up Muslim, um, break up um, opposition rallies. Now, um, let's, then the reason, one of the reasons I, I ask that is, is because that, um, you know, it, it does seem that um, there's a lot of rumor and the the military uses rumor to to basically create a sense of anxiety. Sure. Yeah. And sure enough, the military happens to be the solution to the problem, right? Yeah. Um, so let's go back to your um, to your actual research project. So so then, do you you return to to Burma, or Myanmar? What 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 is what does your research actually look like on the ground? It varied. I I spent several long periods in Myanmar. Um, the longest of which was six months, researching, I guess, the mechanics of the violence, um, and trying more latterly in particular to focus on the perpetrators, um, because mm -hmm. a lot of media coverage inevitably ends up focusing on the victims of violence. So with this latest um, military campaign, because media can't go to Northern Rakhine State, they've homed in on the Rohingya refugees who have fled to Bangladesh. But I've always been interested in what motivates people to mm. participate in um, violence, particularly when it's against their neighbours or one-time friends. Mm. And so uh, I'd go to Rakhine State um, after the 2012 violence, meet with Rohingya, but also try and meet with Rakhine civilians as well. Sure. And latterly try and meet civilians who participated in attacks on Muslim communities. Wow. Um, and so that involved traveling with my Rakhine friend who's appalled by what's happening now. He's a very sort of moderate, sympathetic um, Rakhine activist. Um, and we'd go to villages in uh, or just outside of the state capital, the Sitwe in Rakhine State, that had served as, I guess, a wellspring for mobs of Buddhist Rakhine who would board buses in 2012 that shuttle them into the town. They'd attack Muslim neighborhoods, um, kill Muslim civilians, and then withdraw back to their villages. And we knew where these villages were. So we would hop on a motorbike and just ride up and down this road, um, going into villages, asking around to see if anyone had been affected by the violence. If we found people who had been affected by the violence, then we knew that they had probably witnessed the violence. If they'd witnessed the violence, then they may have taken part in the violence. And so we try and sort of segue the conversation towards their role in what happened. Mm. Um, and that's how the book really opens. Um, I speak with a Rakhine person who in 2012 took part in an attack on a Muslim neighborhood called Nazi in Sitwe um, and laid waste to several houses, several hundred houses, sorry, um, and forced thousands of Muslims to um, the refugee camps that sprung up. Was it burn burning them down or...? Yeah, so they would um, they would travel on buses um, from their villages into the state capital. Who's city. driving these buses? How, how are the buses? No one buses? knows. Huh. Um, this guy just called them the organizers, quote unquote. And what's your speculation? Do you want to speculate on who the organizers <laughs> well, are? One person I spoke to said that um, the village administrator organized the buses or organized groups of men in his village um, to board these buses. Some say that local Rakhine um, political parties organize the buses. Mm -hmm. There's anecdotal evidence that Rakhine activist um, NGOs, for example, helped organize some of the violence as well. It was very much a grassroots effort with the, I guess, nod from the military. Um, and they would be uh, armed with machetes or sticks before they got on the buses. They'd travel into town. They'd be divided into teams, some to sort of steal into the quarter and torch houses, others to amass at exit points um, outside the neighbourhood and attack any fleeing Rohingya. And then a call would go up sort of half an hour later and they would withdraw from the area, jump on the buses and go back. Are these um, people paid as well or, or on the buses? Um, I don't know they were paid. They were offered food by mm -hmm. a local monastery, Buddhist monastery in the town um, for uh, a day's work, mm -hmm. I suppose we can call it. Um, but 
So this differs from the organised mobs that um, attacked towns in central Burma in the right. sense that there are these very deep communal, um, deep and bitter communal antagonisms in Rakhine State between Rakhine Buddhists and Muslim Rohingya. Um, and that provides, you know, a strong motivation to participate in violence. And I think it's important to state that both Rakhine and Rohingya attacked one another, although right. the Rohingya took, you know, a hugely disproportionate share of the violence. Um, but there are very palpable fears among Rakhine that have been cultivated by the military very deliberately, I think, um, of what an empowered Rohingya Muslim minority might do in the state to a sort of Rakhine supremacy. Huh. Well, before we get into more of the details about the, the sort of um, the groups, the, the claimants, these, these two claimants going at it, um, I'm really curious about what are the motivations that you found that are driving people to violence? It varies. So in Rakhine State, you have two communities that are both deeply impoverished, um, but one, the Rakhine, is accepted as um, citizens of the country, as indigenous to the country, and they claim to be the sort of hereditary sons of um, the coastal state, whereas Rohingya are, according to a very popular narrative in Myanmar, um, illegal immigrants, illegal Bengali immigrants, mm -hmm. who provide the vanguard of uh, a crusade to Islamize Myanmar, either Islamize Myanmar or form a breakaway state in northern Rakhine, um, and therefore break up the sort of national, the local society in Rakhine state. So Rakhine often articulate their, um, their animosity or uh, I guess their antagonism towards Rohingya um, as a product of fears that Rohingya are going to overwhelm their resources, um, that they're going to break up local Rakhine society, mm. that these Muslims are marrying our women, they're forcing them to convert to Islam. Um, and that sort of had, that was largely confined to Rakhine state until the transition began. And then it started to be echoed in um, amongst communities elsewhere in the country that probably had little to no contact with, Rohing with Rohingya. Yet still Rohingya became the source of national hysteria. Um, and these sort of very existential fears emerged that with Myanmar being a sort of last bastion of Buddhism in the region, with India having been... Um, with it having been sort of eroded in India by Islam and in Indonesia, Malaysia and so on, that um, were, were these Muslim communities to be enfranchised by the democratic transition, then they would grow in prominence to a point where they could really sort of um, challenge the supremacy of Buddhism. Um, and so these fears vary in Rakhine State, often more material in nature, generally outside of Rakhine State, they have this strong sort of ex existential element to them. Hmm. And, you know, this take this question however you would like, um, do they have any merit to them, these, these anxieties and these claims? Well, the great irony is that um, Rohingya in particular are the most persecuted minority in Myanmar. They're the most powerless minority in Myanmar. They're effectively quarantined in a corner of the country um, from which they're unable to move on the whole. Um, they're subject to movement on uh, restrictions on movement unlike any other community in Myanmar. They're, um, they've been systematically weakened over decades. Uh, they're heavily reliant on international assistance when that's allowed through. They struggle to access healthcare, they struggle to access education, yet they still somehow become the sort of chief threat to society in Myanmar. And that's one of the great ironies and I think one of the sort of crowning achievements of the military's um, ability to manipulate sort of ethnic religious identities in a way that um, raises this sort of spectra of a threat in the form of a powerless Rohingya minority. What about the Rohingya militia? They have this uh, Arakan Rohingya, I forgot the acronym. Arakan uh, Rohingya Salvation Army. Salvation Army, which is, um, you know, that the military points to as evidence of, of uh, this growing threat. Yeah. But what's the state of, of this uh, Salvation Army right now? 
It's difficult to know. They they first came to public attention in October 2016 when they launched um, a series of coordinated attacks on security posts in the Rakhine kind of State. Police or they're attacking police? Yeah, stations? that's right. Uh-huh. Local police stations Local police. and sort of border um, security um, posts. And before then, no one had really known anything about them, um, although they're believed to have started um, mobilising or planning mobilisation after the 2012 violence. Um, And their strategy, which I think indicates their level of organisation and resources, was to attack um, security outposts so that they could... um, well, in part so that, so that they could seize weapons because they didn't have weapons in the first place. So okay. they attacked with machetes. Hmm. Um, and I think that indicates um, really that they're quite an under-resourced group, or at least they were. Um, they were able to mobilise local Rohingya in villages, um, a network of Rohingya cells um, in villages, but it's very much a ragtag army. Um, And after the attacks happened in October, I got the sense from what I read that um, because that forced an exodus of 80,000 Rohingya across the Bangladesh border, which didn't receive much international condemnation. um, And I think Rohingya were very much sort of aggrieved and upset that this a group that supposedly represented their interests had basically pulled a move like that that was essentially um, suicidal mm-hmm. for them. I think several hundred were killed. Um, and now we have this latest um, eruption which happened in August. And their strategy seems to be, because they don't pose a security threat to the state in Myanmar, um, I think it's ludicrous to think that they pose a real threat. Um, but their strategy seems to be you know, we trigger a response from the military and the world sort of starts to take attention, um, take notice of the plight of the Rohingya. Hmm. Yet what's happened now is that 615,000 people have crossed into Bangladesh. It's the most concentrated refugee flow since the Rwanda genocide. Um, And the government, the military, has essentially used an attack by uh, this ragtag army as a pretext to sort of um, I guess, intensify a campaign of ethnic cleansing um, against the Rohingya. What do you make of, of Myanmar's you know, political leadership? I know that Aung San Suu Kyi is often blamed uh, for not doing enough about the Rohingya. Um, I think a lot of people who actually go to Myanmar are skeptical of that uh, viewpoint. What, what is your take on and what the government can do, and particularly Aung San Suu Kyi is, as the state councillor. She's not actually head of the country, but she's de facto head. Right, so she's exactly de facto head. Um, she's not allowed to be uh, the president of the country. Um, there's So there are two things. She, she, When she came to power, or de facto power, she acquiesced in a very delicate power-sharing agreement with the military. So the military still retains control of key ministries, um, it retains control of the economy. That was all part of the deal um, that it, uh, I guess, almost agreed whether there's anything on paper with the government. Um, and the government knew that when it came to power, the military would still hold de facto power. Um, And so there's a strong contingent of military MPs in parliament. So Aung San Suu Kyi, the National League for Democracy, are to a degree beholden to the military. Um, They operate autonomously from civilian rule. Um, And she's also beholden to quite a powerful Buddhist nationalist lobby, Mm. which... Um, makes up a huge chunk of her support base. Mm. Um, And what's, I think, been quite shocking for many is the fact that for so long the population had steadfastly resisted the divisive politicking of the military, um, had for so long opposed military abuses, And now, because all forces, all political forces in society seem to be aligned on this one issue, um, which is that the Rohingya are a threat, are a danger to society and need to be rid of the country, um, suddenly we have this um, 
sort of upending of a long-held conventional view of Myanmar, which was uh, almost virtuous society on op in opposition to a bad military. Right. Now we have this bizarre alignment between the two forces um, that I don't think anyone had really foreseen the extent to um, extent to which the population would flip almost um, and want to, at least on this campaign against the Rohingya, effectively join hands with the military in forcing this population out. Would you say that democracy has been a good thing for the country? Uh, or, or that's just, a million dollar question. That's a hard one, right? I mean, because things, you could make an argument that things are just kind of a lot more chaotic and divisive and um, a, lot, a lot more deaths, that's, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, what do you, how do you, how do you sort of grapple with that that it's a it's a it's a puzzle for people like you and me uh people who you know grew up in, in democratic countries who are exactly. having our own problems with democracy at home yeah and then we're thinking about oh is this something we really want to promote all around the world well i think if it's going to be promoted um it needs to be promoted very carefully and um i think what happened in myanmar is that uh Western nations had a incredibly romanticized view of the country and of the pro-democracy movement. Um, and that's our own fault entirely. And we raised Aung San Suu Kyi to this pedestal um, that, uh, you know, that, that was so high that any sort of... Um, so any mortal or human being could yeah, live up to it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and I think what we need to know, what we need to be clear on is that you sh one shouldn't breathlessly endorse an opposition um, that hasn't really been tested. And in Myanmar, there was an assumption that because the pro-democracy movement, as we came to know it, um, stood against military rule, that meant it stood for democracy and democracy meant equal rights for all. And that's been completely upended. Um, and I think the fault was that there was no interrogation of the ideals of the pro-democracy movement, particularly at senior figureheads in the National League for Democracy, yeah. who are now um, espousing deeply hateful views of the Rohingya. Um, and no sort of deep questioning of what vision that opposition had for society in Myanmar beyond the instalment of Suu Kyi and the National League for Democracy in power. Um, and I suppose ultimately it's not our place to judge whether democracy has been a good thing or a bad thing for Myanmar. Authoritarian rule denies people agency. Um, they deserve to have that agency. Um, but then what they do with that agency is another question that we hadn't really grappled with when, um, you know, when Western nations were sort of formulating policy for Myanmar. Mm -hmm. We didn't look at the sort of grassroots. We didn't look at these sort of hidden fault lines in society. And I think we're steadily realizing that they've been there all along, that we should have noticed them beforehand, and that we should have prepared for their eventual eruption. Sounds like things that we might have thought about for other countries like Iraq or, exactly, or other, other exactly. places. I think it's a universal lesson. Absolutely. Um, Francis, this has been an incredibly interesting conversation about your book. Um, maybe could you just give us a, a, a last word about, um, well, anything you'd like to say finally, but also kind of what's at stake here? Because I remember in some of my visits to Myanmar, uh, I heard something surprising and I'd like to get your assessment, which is that this Rohingya story could actually foster an incredible breeding ground for terrorism or vi terrorist violence in Myanmar. When you think about global, you know, Islamist terrorism, um, the, the story of the Rohingya turns Myanmar into a potential target. Um, so I don't want to throw put that in, in your mouth but um but but w w what's at stake here what what you know what were the what are the paths um that could that could uh you know roll out in front of us well i think there is a risk that this could um take on a new dimension um as the situation advances there's now a population of 600,000 plus um newly displaced displaced refugees in bangladesh 
um, they join an existing uh, Rohingya refugee population in Bangladesh of uh, 300,000 plus. There's almost a million stateless um, people in Bangladesh. Their chances of being able to go home um, are very slim. Those that can go back to Rakhine State are likely to be placed in what the government has said will be repatriation camps that I think will become replicas of the internment camps that um, hundreds of thousands, that 100,000 plus Rohingya live in elsewhere in the state and from which they're not allowed to leave. Um, and I guess it's, you know, it's conflict studies 101 that if you persecute a uh, population, if you remove any sort of institutional channels through which they can negotiate their grievances, um, if you block them off from um, power, from positions of power, or from being able to voice um, their desires for power, then the only option that really uh, is left to them, unless they want to sort of continue this existence, this incredibly powerless existence, is to um, move to, I guess, a more aggressive stance. And certainly the insurgents within the Rohingya community, who are very much a minority, I think we need to be clear on that, um, because often we talk about Rohingya as a sort of collective entity. Um, the insurgents are a min minority, but they obviously realised that there was potential for um, exploitation of these grievances um, amongst the Rohingya population. If it becomes the case that international terrorist groups try and do the same, then we could have a very worrying um, situation on our hands. I think the situation is already extremely bleak, um, deeply concerning. If groups try to move into the camps in Bangladesh and try and recruit, um, then it becomes an international crisis um, of magnitude beyond what we have already. Um, and I think that's something we need to be prepared for. Um, the Rohingya have long eschewed violence. Um, the irony is that they're the last minority group in the country to have to give birth to an insurgency. Ethnic minorities all over the country have had um, insurgencies in full swing for half a century. I guess the question is why and how the Rohingya managed to stave that off for as long as they did, um, given the conditions they faced. But now you know, a turning point's happened um, and we need to look to what I think is a very concerning future. Francis Wade is author of Myanmar's Enemy Within, a brand new book on the Rohingya crisis in Myanmar and uh, worth everyone's attention. You can get uh, obtain his book on Amazon.com and I uh, really hope everyone checks it out. It's been getting all kinds of great praise from uh, Los Angeles Review of Books, Time Magazine, The Economist, and, and other outlets. Uh, congratulations, Francis, and great to see you today. Thank you. Thanks for that, David.